Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another video. In this video, we're gonna be diving into the world of DFIR, digital forensics and incident response. If you saw my recent Thirsty Thursday, we were talking about this topic and it really intrigued me to go down a few little videos on this topic because it's dear to my heart. I've done it before, I've done it for many years and I shied away from it. I just never talked about it on this channel. So if you're new to cybersecurity or if you're you know, in cybersecurity and you wanna get into DFIR, this video is for you. So watch to the end and let's have some fun. All right, so we are going to talk about a few different sections in this video. I have a few written down what I wanna cover, right? First, we're gonna go over what is digital forensics, right? Not incident response, we're not on that side yet. And I wrote a few points from my Thursday Thursday live stream, and I wanna you know, talk about those topics and talk about what we talked about then, but put it in my own words and from my experiences, right? So obviously in simple terms, G said it really well, I think he conveyed this. So what exactly is a digital forensics case or what is digital forensics in general, right? In simple terms, it's digital forensics that involves a you know recovery or an investigation of any kind of digital devices. It can be a smartphone, it can be a laptop, it can be a hard drive, it can be a computer, you know, your your tablet, you know, it can be anything digital related. That's why it's called digital forensics, right? And often we relate to this to cybercrime, right? We go to court, we have some kind of evidence for this case, and then we present that, right? So it's really, really interesting. So when you are in contact with this device, you know, it's like being a digital detective, right? Where you can analyze and uncover any kind of data that resides on that device, whatever, you know? So what we need to do is see what happened in the case, how it happened, and most importantly, who did it? Sometimes that's not, you know, depending on who the hacker is or who the intruder is or whatever, maybe they're going to clear their tracks. But like we said, if it's in memory, if the machine is rebooted, it's lost. But if you even have a hard drive and you reformat it, it still has data, you know, on that drive, unless you write zeros to the drive, but that's on a whole nother topic. So now we're going to go ahead and discuss some key points and break down the process of digital forensics, right? So the first thing is identification. In my opinion, we have to identify where exactly this happened. You know, what kind of evidence do we have? and think of the ways to pinpoint where we need to look, right? That's number one. Uh, number two is preservation, right? So we have to preserve, and once we find the potential evidence, we have to preserve that, right? So make sure it's not tampered with, make sure it's not messed with or anything. And in order to do that, we might be taking snapshots. We might create uh, forensic images of the digital devices, right? That's always, always something that we can do. Obviously, the next thing I have on my list is collection, right? Here we can gather all the relevant data, right? Ensuring that we have the comprehensive information to work with if it's a court case or, you know, just a case in, in house or whatever you want, however you want to do that, right? The next thing we have to do ex is examine it, examination, right? This step involves deep diving into the data, looking for specific information that we need to recover, right? Deleted files, analyze metadata, maybe emails, whatever it is, right? The, the list goes on, but you just, whatever case you are working on, make sure you examine what, you're, what you need to. And the next thing is reporting, right? We wanna actually report on our findings. We need to make sure everything is documented into a report so we can use this for legal you know, processes, uh, organizational review for your company, for the police, for court, however you want to do that. So that's pretty much section or step number one, right? So in the next thing we're going to talk about is now what on, what is incident response? We just talked about digital forensics and incident response, right? So what is the second part of this? So now let's talk about, you know, what is incident response? In general, incident response is the process of managing you know, in addressing security incidents, right? 
So we want to respond to threats, mitigating damages quickly and effectively. What does this mean? Say if I'm an intruder, if I'm someone in your network and I'm dumping your passwords or I'm trying to exfiltrate data, we want to make sure we quarantine, contain that machine, contain that person, delete whatever we need to do. And we'll talk about tools and everything shortly in order for us to actually capture this attacker. And it's really fun. So I know I talk about a lot of red team hacking stuff, pen testing, but the blue team has some exciting stuff too. So this is so you guys get aware of the DFIR aspect and incident response aspect of, you know, a SOC analyst or a security engineer or whatever you want to call it, right? Or an IR engineer, incident response engineer. So some key topics here are, you know, we can talk about preparation, you know, deploying and maintaining an incident, re incident response plan, a playbook, some kind of plan, God forbid this happens to us. How do we respond to an incident, right? If you get malware, ransomware, you get actual, you know, compromise, etc. And I really like, like these kind of documentation, I really enjoy because it's really fun. I like to uh, put things in place. So I actually have some documentation that I've done for previous companies and, you know, I keep them you know, close to my heart because it, it was a lot of good work and stuff that, you know, I made an impact for an organization. So that, you know, it, it makes, it makes me feel like it was a, is an, is an accomplishment, right? So first thing is preparation. Next thing is identification. We want to, you know, det we want to detect and determine the scope of the incident, right? We want to see how much we have to work with, right? The next thing I said it previously is containment, right? We want to isolate this this machine, whatever system, so we don't have further damage into the network, into the environment, and we you know we just want to stop them in their tracks, right? So the next thing is recovery, right? So we want to make sure we restore and validate the systems, or, or user or whomever, you know, to you know to functional a functional level. Right. And the next thing we need to lay out is the lessons learned. I think that's super critical in my opinion. Right. What did we learn from this incident? Right. Review an incident response plan and then uh, like for further God forbid a response or IR incidents, we have some better strategies in place. So God forbid this doesn't happen again. Right. So how do we you know, what kind of tools are we talking about? Right. And did I say, did I mention tools before? No, I didn't mention the tools for the first section for the digital forensics. So some common tools that we use in digital forensics is like uh, uh, FTK Imager, in case autopsy and so many other tools to analyze and interpret that data effectively, right? So now let's come back down here. So now the tools that we can utilize for the IR aspect is like a SIM solution, Microsoft Sentinel, Splunk, etc. We can have something like an EDR. We talked about that on Thursday as well. Uh, endpoint detection and response. We can have MDRs. We can have network monitoring tools. We have stuff like that in place because forensics, remember what we said, we can have network forensics. We have you know, Wireshark we, for other tools. We have so many different kinds of forensics to investigate in certain instances, right? Or, you know, compromises. So the next thing we're going to be talking about is the importance of having a DFIR or the importance of DFIR, right? So obviously DF DFIR is super critical in protecting your organizations against cyber crime, cyber criminal adversaries, etc. So by quickly identifying and responding to these incidents, we can minimize the damage, right? This make sure we have stuff in place so we can recover the systems more quickly, more rapidly, more efficiently, right? Is that a word? Efficiently? I think. Whatever. More efficient. Whatever. I, my English sucks. So the next thing is like legal and compliance, right? So digital forensics also plays a role in the legal space, in legal investigation, ensuring compliance uh, with, uh, with regulations, right? So properly conduct this forensics that we can, you know, like present in court, right? This evidence in court. So that's definitely another step if you're interested in that. Obviously, know that comes with the game. The next thing we can do is improve upon our security posture, right? Instant response obviously helps organizations identify weaknesses, definitely, 
in their security posture. And this is why it's super critical to have this in place, right? So this allows them to make the necessary improvements and strengthen their defenses to make sure, you know, the bad guy doesn't get in again. And that's why they have purple team engagements. That's why people do pen testing and red team engagements, etc., to work with the, the blue team to see how, if God forbid, a real attacker, they can simulate that and we can act as a team. And that's why they have a purple team, blue team, red team. If that makes sense. Hopefully that all lines up and adds up. So let's talk about a real world application and case study. I just wrote this down this morning. So <laughs> it's, it, it's really interesting. So let's look at a couple real world scenarios, right? For an example, if a, rec if a recent data breach incident, the forensics team was able to trace the source of a data breach back to a phishing email that was compromised by an employee's credentials. This is why I put this on because this recently happened. Right By analyzing the network logs and email headers, they identified the attacker and blocked access. So I just generalized this. So what does this mean? So say now we can see the user that got compromised. We can go back to that user. We can look at the email that they clicked on. We can look at the headers of that email. We can do it in Outlook. We can take that header and we can analyze that in different applications. Go online, just put free email header analyzer and you can just throw your headers in there. And we can see the, you know, normally this is real world, you know, this is just a hypothetical situation, but in the real world, you're going to try to anonymize yourself. You're going to maybe use proxy change. You're going to use VPNs and you're going to use like maybe proton mail. So it's, you know, you're going to use ways to try to anonymize yourself as best as possible. And if I send you, you know, from a IP address 65656565, and that's what's in the header, the next time I send you an email, it's probably going to come from 67676767, for an example. So you just have to, you know, obviously with that block of IPs, wherever they're going, you can go on Aaron, you can see the block of IPs and just block that whole block if you're not expecting any traffic. But that's, you know, that's more for if you're a security engineer and you're going into into that aspect. I don't want to go on with a rant because I can talk for hours about that, right? So what is the lessons learned in this case study, right? From this case, we learned the importance of quick response and uh, detection and response, right? Each incident helps us refine our strategies, improving our defenses. So now in this case, maybe they need to do more security awareness training. Maybe, you know, I, I put a funny meme yesterday on Instagram where we set up a, you know, email phishing and where the malicious thing was, was in the link or in the button that when it says report phishing. So when you hit report phishing, it's actually the malicious link. So it was pretty interesting. So that's, you know, that's ways to also get people and harvest their credentials and get information. But this is not about that. I just want to throw that out there, right? So in that case, what you can do is hover over that, see what the URL is, copy that URL, put it in like URL scan or some kind of sandbox and record a future or whatever, you know, Joe Sandbox or whatever you want to use and analyze that. And I really enjoy that stuff and I do it almost every day, but I don't talk about it. But um, hint, hint. So the next section that we can talk about is how to get started in DFIR, right? We'll close it up, getting started and getting information on uh, getting experience, right? So if you're interested in the career in DFIR, consider obviously doing maybe some try hack me and i'm not sure if hack the box has like any dfir so you can go and try hack me you can get some certifications obviously your security plus you can get like um uh, gcfa gcif from sans and you can do i always say if you start if you want to get into dfir if you can get some kind of offensive mindset you can be a better defensive aspect or defend, defensive uh, analyst or practitioner and vice versa, right? If you want to become a hacker, pen test, et cetera, if you get more on the, you know, understanding the blue team, you can, you know what their defenses are. So it's like a cat and mouse game. So that's just my take. And I feel like that makes me a better practitioner overall because I came from that network security background and I got into, I did get into DFIR, which I don't really talk about too much and then doing the offensive stuff, right? 
So obviously the ways you can build some skills, my favorite, hands-on labs, right? So you can develop the practical skills in the area of networking, right? You wanna learn Wireshark, you wanna understand like uh, Zeke, or also known as I think the boy, you know, understand Splunk, excuse me, Snort, IDSs, IPSs, and understand how to analyze data, right? If I'm sending a packet, what is a three-way handshake? What is a TCP dump? Understanding that because you're gonna be looking at that if you're doing networking, right? O operating systems, some programming, and getting you know your hands on maybe building a lab and stuff like that all right so that's pretty much it so pretty much participate in labs simulations get your hands on projects and if you have any projects that you're working on throw it in the comments i would love to hear about your journey into dfir right so also stay, stay updated with the latest tools and trends by following different groups communities you know twitter reddit uh, hacker news and just see what's going out going on out there right and yeah that's pretty much that sums it up so you know hopefully you know dfir is a vital part of cybersecurity, right if you're trying to get into the blue team if you want to help organizations respond to incidents and conduct I investigations right so by understanding and applying all these principles to dfir we can be you know we can make companies a better security or better secured environments and having their digital assets you know super secure and have that environment good so yeah that's it you know if you like the video obviously please like subscribe and share comment below and uh, share your thoughts and questions in the comments below like i always say you know i love you guys i really appreciate everything let's get to a hundred thousand this year and uh if there's anything i missed if there anything that you want to add throw it in the comments for other folks to uh learn and uh succeed and level up their skills, right? So thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Appreciate it. Stay tuned for more videos and uh, see you guys in the next one.